So welcome. Hello, welcome to this uh, ICM invited lecture. I am Balint Toth from the University of Bristol and the Rainy Institute of Mathematics in Budapest. It is my privilege and my honor to introduce Dmitry Panchenko from the University of Toronto. Dmitry is best known for his substantial results on spin glass models, and in particular for proving Paris's notorious ultrametricity conjecture for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, about which we will hear more details soon. I am sure that I don't speak only for myself when using this occasion, I explicitly express my sympathy and solidarity with all victims of the barbaric aggression against the Ukraine. We are mathematicians. Our weapons against barbarism are Bernstein's inequality, Skorohod embedding, Hinchin's law of the iterated logarithm, Kolmogorov's three series theorems, and much more of the likes. So this will be a recorded lecture. So unfortunately, there will be no possibility to directly raise questions to the speaker. Thank you very much. The topic of my talk is ultrametricity in spin glass models. Now, spin glasses as a field of theoretical physics grew out from the attempts to understand the behavior of certain magnetic alloys. And over time, this field produced many interesting techniques and important ideas that also found applications in many other areas. For example, in the study of some optimization, random optimization problems. Now, one of the central ideas that were discovered by the physicists in this field is that you know, many of these systems or models that they have been studying can have multiple equilibrium states. And more importantly, that these states can be organized in a very non-trivial way. What it means is that, you know, the location of these states in space can have some non-trivial structure. And in particular, with respect to the distance between these states, they can be clustered in a hierarchical way. And this is what is called ultrametricity in the setting of uh, spin glass models. Now, Ultrametricity first appeared in the work of Giorgio Parisi, and then later it was interpreted in terms of these multiple equilibrium states by Parisi himself, and also in the work of Parisi with Mizard, Sourless, Toulouse, and Virasoro. And the main result I wanted to present in this talk is a way or an approach to try to explain this picture discovered by the physicists in a rigorous way. And so before I introduce the background um, of spin glasses and the motivation for this main result, I'm actually going to start by presenting this result because there is a way to introduce it that does not actually require any background knowledge or any special definitions. And then in the second half of my talk, I will discuss in more detail this background and motivation for this result. So I'm going to start by describing a sequential construction of um, some random tree, okay, where the root of this tree will be at height zero and the leaves of the tree will be at height one. And we will have one parameter in this construction, this probability distribution zeta on the interval 0, 1 that will be used at each step to decide at which height a new branch leading to this new leaf is attached to the tree. And so once we construct this infinite tree, then for any pair of leaves, we are going to consider the paths from the root leading to these leaves, and then the height at which these two paths separates, separate will be called the overlap between these two leaves or the overlap corresponding to this pair of indices L and L prime, and it will be denoted by R L L prime. 
And so this infinite tree will give rise to the infinite array of overlaps. And then we are going to discuss several properties that this array satisfies, which essentially immediately uh, follow from the construction of this tree. And the main result will say that if an array, this infinite array, satisfies these properties A, B, and C, then it must be generated in distribution by this tree construction that I'm going to describe with the parameter zeta being just the distribution of one of diagonal entry of this array. And the main point of this result will be that these properties A, B, and C, they do not refer explicitly to this tree structure. So a priori the array does not have to correspond to such a tree structure, but these properties A, B, and C are strong enough to ensure that the array actually does correspond to this particular random tree. And so let me start by describing the sequential random tree construction. So suppose we already constructed the tree with n leaves and I'm going to describe how the next leaf is attached to this tree. Now of course here I didn't say it explicitly but the first leaf is attached directly to the root so the branch, the first branch is attached at height zero. And then given um, n leaves, what we are going to do is the following. In the next step, first we pick one of these leaves at random, uniformly at random. And we also mark the path from the root to this leaf because the next leaf or the next branch will be attached somewhere to this path. And also we note the height HL at which this leaf number L was attached to the tree in its own term. So in other words, when the tree had L minus 1 leaves, what was the height that the leaf number L was attached to the tree? And then in the second step, we generate a new random variable Tn plus 1 from this parameter distribution zeta. Okay, so that's where this parameter zeta comes into play. And then we have two cases. So the first case, if this random variable is above or greater than HL, then we attach the new branch exactly at that height. And for the future, we record that the height HN plus 1, where this new leaf is attached, is exactly this. And in the second case where this random variable is less than HL, we are actually rounding up to HL and we attach a new branch at the height HL. And again, we record that HN plus 1, so the height where we attach this new leaf is exactly this. And so that's the entire procedure, um, how we attach the leaf sequentially. And so then we continue this until we construct a countably infinite tree. And as I said before, given this tree, then we consider the array of overlaps, which we can also view as an alternative description of this tree, right? Because the entries of this array essentially are telling us the height at which the tree is branching. And so next, I'm going to describe several properties that uh, this array satisfies. So to describe the first property, let's consider two cases. So the first case is when at the first step we pick a leaf L not equal to one. Okay, and so by definition, we know that we will attach a new um, branch or a new leaf to this path somewhere at the height HL or above. And what this implies is that the overlap between the first leaf and the new leaf n plus 1 will actually be equal to the overlap between the first leaf and the leaf number L. Right? Because when, you know, if we think about walking down the tree 
from the leaves to the root. By our construction, the two leaves L and N plus 1, they will meet first, and then later on they will meet uh, leaf number 1 somewhere below that. And so that really means that the, the new overlap between first leaf and leaf N plus 1 actually will be completely determined by, by what we see up to step n, right? It will be simply equal to this overlap R1L. And now in the second case, if we pick at random the leaf number one, since this leaf was attached directly to the root, so the height H0 was zero, there is no constraint where we attach a new leaf to this path. And so this implies that in this case, the overlap between the first leaf and n plus one, it will be completely independent from what we see up to that point, And it will be just this random variable from the distribution zeta. And so these two cases together can be put into one equation, which is called the Gelanda guerra identities. Okay, which simply says that the distribution of overlap between leaf number one and n plus one conditionally on the tree up to time n is given by this mixture of distributions, right? Where in this mixture, that's exactly depending on the first step. So if at the first step we pick leaf uh, L from two to n, then, as we said above, the, this overlap is completely determined. So the distribution is just this delta function on the value R1L, right? And then if we picked the first leaf, then the distribution, you know, then this overlap is generated completely independently of what we see up to that point. So its distribution is just that parameter Z. Okay, and so we have this first property called the Gelanda guerra identities. And right away, I want to point out that in the derivation of this equation, we did use the tree structure, but this equation or these equations by themselves do not actually imply that there is a tree structure. So for example, if we apply any transformation phi to all the entries of the array, identities will still be preserved, just the parameter zeta will be transformed you know, by this map phi, but the identities will all still hold. But transforming the entries of this array actually can completely destroy the tree structure or completely hide this tree structure. So the identities by themselves do not explicitly contain or refer to this tree structure. All right, then let me describe the second property, namely that this overlap array is symmetric and positive definite or positive semi-definite. And the symmetric part is obvious from the definition and one can show positive definiteness in various ways. For example, one can actually explicitly embed this tree into Hilbert space in such a way that the overlap between any two points will be just a scalar product in the Hilbert space. So the overlap matrix will be just a gram matrix, so it will be positive semi-definite. Now I want to show a different way because I want to express um, this tree structure in terms of overlaps a little bit more explicitly since this is, you know, exactly what ultrametricity of the overlaps will mean, and this is the topic of this talk. And so one can see positive definiteness as follows. So suppose we cut, we take any height Q, and then we cut the tree at that height. Then all the leaves will be separated into separate clusters, right, depending on which branch, you know, if they are above the branch that was cut, that's one cluster. And so if we look at the matrix of indicators 
that the overlap is greater or equal than this height q, right, this indicator will be 1 if they are in the same cluster or above the same branch that we cut, or it will be 0 otherwise. And so this matrix will be just a block diagonal right, with, with blocks corresponding to these clusters, and within it, one block, this indicator is just all, I mean, this block consists of all ones. And such matrix is clearly positive semi-definite. And so then the overlap can be expressed simply as an integral of this indicator. And so as a result, the overlap matrix is also positive semi-definite. Okay, so that's the second property. And then the last property is the so-called exchangeability, which states that if we permute the leaves by an arbitrary permutation pi, then the distribution of the overlap array will not be affected. So if we take our overlap array and permute uh, the indices, or in other words, we permute the rows and columns by the same permutation pi, we will get the same array in distribution. Now, this property is maybe the least obvious uh, from this particular construction because, well, it does look like, you know, the distribution, because of the sequential construction, the distribution appears to depend on the order of the leaves. And in particular, it looks like the first leaf plays a special role. But it turns out that given a particular configuration of the tree, one can compute the probability to observe the tree in this configuration in a way that does not require the knowledge of the order of the leaves in this tree. And so that exactly means that the distribution does not depend on the order of the leaves or we have this symmetry of the array in distribution. Now, this calculation is um, not difficult, but we are not going to do this here. I mean, it requires a little bit of a calculation, so I'm not going to talk about this here, but that's another property that we have, that this array has this symmetry, or the array is what is called exchangeable. And so, we observe that given this random tree construction, the overlap array corresponding to this tree satisfies these properties A, B, and C. And as I said before, the main result that I wanted to present is that if the array satisfies these properties A, B, and C, then it must correspond to this particular um, tree construction with the parameter zeta being just the distribution of one of diagonal entry uh, of this array. Or another way to say this is that um, the distribution of such overlap array that satisfies these properties A, B, and C is completely determined by the distribution of one of diagonal entry of this array. And so, before I go to the second part of my talk and describe the background and motivation for this result, let me first discuss ultrametricity um, in a little bit more detail. So, as I said before, this tree structure can be expressed in terms of the array of overlaps, which is called ultrametricity of this array. And there are several ways that one can express this. So first is what we already said before, that if we take any level or any q between 0 and 1, then the relationship between the leaves defined by the fact that the overlap is greater or equal than q is an equivalence relation. Okay, so it's kind of another way to say that if we cut, when we cut the tree at, at that level, cutting of the tree separated all the leaves into clusters, which are just equivalence clusters under this relation. Now, there is another way one can express uh, the same thing, is just by saying that if we pick any three 
indices or any three leaves and look at their pairwise overlaps, then one overlap will always be at least as big as the minimum of the other two. Or another way to say this is that the two smallest overlaps will always be equal. And yet another way to describe the same thing is, as I said before, we can embed this tree in, into a Hilbert space in such a way that the overlap will be just a scalar product of you know, the leaves under this embedding given by some sequence HL in this Hilbert space. And in this case, we can flip the inequality for scalar products and express it in terms of the distances by saying that the distances between you know, the, these points satisfy the usual classical ultrametric inequality for the distances. And so, of course, this is where this terminology, ultrametricity of this overlap matrix comes from. Now, what is interesting that is that in this particular construction of this random tree that I described, one can take this sequence HL in the Hilbert space to be an IID sample from some random measure on this Hilbert space. And this random measure is very explicit and it's called the Ruel probability cascades. And the sequential construction that I described above, it's called the Goldschmidt-Martin algorithm for generating a sample from uh, this random measure called Ruel probability cascades. And so what is interesting is that behind this random tree construction, there is this very interesting object, this random measure on the Hilbert space, which can actually be constructed rather explicitly in terms of some Poisson point processes. And the properties of this random measure are actually very important in applications. So in some sense, this uh, this real probability cascades is, is a more fundamental object in applications, but because it's a little bit more difficult to define for the purpose of this talk, it's more convenient to uh, work with, you know, with the sequential construction of the random tree. And actually in applications, the these properties B and C, that the array is positive, semi-definite, and exchangeable, they will be automatic. So they will be just built in to the definition of the overlaps in the spin glass models. And the key property will actually be uh, these Gernanda Guerra identities. So the main message of this result is that the Gernanda Guerra identities imply ultrametricity of the overlaps. And so now I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk and describe some background information and some motivation for this result. I'll start by introducing the shear interkirkpatrick model in spin glasses where this ultrametricity first was discovered. Now, this model can be viewed as a random optimization problem. And it's, it is often described as the so-called Dean's uh, problem of assigning students to dorms. So let's say we have a set of n students labeled 1 through n, and we have two dorms labeled minus 1 and plus 1. And we want to assign these students to dorms, which is encoded by these vectors sigma, which we will call assignments or configurations, where each coordinate is just the label of the dorm that that particular student is assigned to. And then the main parameter parameters in this model are these so-called interaction parameters, where for each pair of students i and j, this parameter is positive when the students i and j like each other and it's negative when the students i and j dislike each other. And then given these parameters, we consider what is called the comfort function 
or it's also called the Hamiltonian or energy of the model, which is just the sum over all pairs of students of these interaction parameters multiplied by sigma i sigma j. And what this does is that if, if two students are in the same dorm, so the sigma i times sigma j is equal to plus one, then we count the interaction with a plus sign, and otherwise we count the interaction with the minus sign. And so the goal or the Dean's problem is to maximize this comfort function, which really means maximizing the comfort within the dorms. And then we do not study this problem for, you know, just arbitrary deterministic parameters. In fact, we want to study sort of the typical behavior of this comfort function. And this means that we actually take the interaction to be random variables, right? They, they are taken to be independent for all the pairs and with the common distribution, which is centered. And the canonical choice is the Gaussian random variables with variance one over n. And this normalization one over n, it simply makes uh, the maximum of this comfort function to grow uh, linearly or to be of the same order as the number of students. And the choice of the Gaussian distribution is the classical one, and it's the easiest one to work with. But after, you know, the model is solved, so to speak, it turns out that one can prove some universality results which show that the choice of the distribution is not really important as long as it has a finite um, variance 1 over n. So in this setup, uh, Giorgio Parisi in 1979 discovered some exact formula from which one can in particular derive that the limit of the maximum scaled by n is equal to some particular value, which can be described again by a, an explicit formula, and which is equal approximately to this number 0.7633. So just for uh, curiosity, if we use this limiting um, number as an approximation for the case of 10,000 students, then an average student under random assignment to the dorm would have approximately 2,500 students that they dislike, while under optimal assignment, this number would tell us that the, a student would have uh, 38 fewer enemies. And so, instead of dealing with the maximum directly, what the physicists actually do is they compute first the free energy of the model which is defined by this formula here where we sum over all possible assignments the energy of the model on this exponential scale so exponential beta times uh, the energy where this parameter beta is called the inverse temperature parameter and one can think of this free energy as a nice or sort of a smooth approximation for the maximum. So there is a simple relationship between free energy and the maximum given by these two inequalities where the lower bound can be seen just by taking one largest term in the sum in the definition of the free energy. And the upper bound can be seen by replacing every term in the sum by the largest one. And because there are two to the n terms, there are two to the n different assignments, if we scale free energy by beta, we see that the difference between upper bound and lower bound will be um, log of two divided by beta. So what this means is that at zero temperature, or when we send beta to infinity, we, we really recover this maximum. And it also means that we can interchange these limits. And if we can compute the limit of the free energy, 
for all inverse temperature parameters, then we can send temperature to zero later to compute the limit uh, for this maximum. And so Parisi discovered that the limit of this free energy can be written by this variational formula. It can be given as this infimum over what is called a functional order parameter, zeta, which is the same parameter that was in the definition of the random tree. So it's just a distribution on the interval 0, 1. Only here it's more convenient to think of uh, this directly as a cumulative distribution function of this distribution. And where the functional that we optimize, well, the second term is just the simple linear functional of zeta. And the first term is, is a nonlinear functional of zeta, which is defined through this function of two variables t and x, that itself is defined as the solution of this parabolic differential equation with the boundary condition at time 1 given by this function log of 2 hyperbolic cosine of beta x. And this formula was rigorously proved in 2003 where Guerra proved an upper bound and then Telegram proved the lower bound and both of these proofs rely on some interpolation techniques. In fact, there are um, many sort of interesting techniques and ideas that have been used in the calculation uh, of this formula. So on the physics side, there is famous replica method and cavity method. Um, on the math side, um, interpolation techniques play a very important role, but also the physicist's uh, cavity method can be used to for example, derive the lower bound. And in fact, the result that I presented, the main result of this talk, can also be used to give a different proof for the lower bound once we know, um, you know this ultrametricity result for the overlaps. But in this talk, I'm only going to focus on one aspect, and this is really the overlaps and the distribution of the overlaps. So let me explain what the overlaps mean in the setting of this model. So first we consider a Gibbs distribution Gn on assignments, which is a probability distribution proportional to the term in the definition of the free energy, proportional to this exponential of beta h, right? which as we can see assigns more weight to configurations with a higher energy. And then we consider an IID sample from this distribution, uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, and so on, which are called replicas. And then the overlap between replicas is defined by this formula. So it's just a scalar product of two configurations normalized by n to make it of order 1. Right, so that's how the replicas are defined in this setting. And the goal is to understand the distribution of this overlap, the array of overlaps between replicas. So it turns out that when trying to compute the free energy, in all different approaches, one way or another, one has to understand the distribution of this overlap array. And so one uh, way to, to get what we want is through, through this main result that I mentioned above. And by the way, let me note right away that, as I said before, this array is symmetric positive definite just by definition. It's an array of scalar products, so it's a gram array, and it's exchangeable because the permutation of the indices just corresponds to permuting an IID sample from the Gibbs measure, which of course will be the same IID sample. Right? So exchangeability is um, built into the definition of this overlap arrays in this setting. And um, let me just mention that when Sherrington and, and Kirkpatrick introduced their model in 75. They already computed 
the free energy. In fact, they call this um, solvable model of a spin glass. So they actually solved it in the sense of computing the free energy. And in modern understanding, one can say that they computed uh, the free energy under the assumption that all these overlaps between replicas will be approximately constants. Right? They will concentrate on some constant value, which is called what is called replica symmetry, and which can be thought of as um, some sort of law of large numbers. Right? Because, for example, if the Gibbs measure looked like a product measure, this would be exactly the usual law of large numbers. But as Sherrington and Kirkpatrick noticed uh, themselves, the answer that they, they got could not be correct for large values of beta. It only worked for small enough values of beta. And so this assumption you know, could not be correct. And then in 1979, you know, that formula that Parisi discovered was done by finding the right way to break replica symmetry, which of course means that the distribution of overlaps can no longer be trivial, cannot concentrate on, on a constant. And another key assumption in Parisi's uh, approach or Parisi's solution was taking this array of overlap to be ultrametric, exactly in the sense that I described above. And later on, um, this picture or this particular way to break uh, replica symmetry was interpreted in terms of equilibrium pure states, hierarchically organized, which roughly means the following, that we can decompose the system into disjoint subsets or disjoint states so that the Gibbs measure will be approximately written as a convex combination of the conditional Gibbs measures, so the Gibbs measure, measure condition to these subsets or these states. Now these states will be equilibrium or pure states in the sense that they will be replica symmetric. And if we sample replicas from this conditional measure, then the overlap will concentrate on some constant. And in particular, this means that the state itself is completely described by its barycenter, or which is also called magnetization. So the magnetization of the state, which is just the average assignment or average configuration with respect to this conditional Gibbs measure, is, is the description of the state. And these uh, barycenters form approximately ultrametric set. So these very center is what would basically be the leaves of the tree that I described. And according to their distances, they can be organized into this tree. And so uh, in this Parisi solution, the fact that the overlap can have a non-trivial distribution, one can you know, read off from the Parisi formula. So this parameter zeta is, is now this parameter in the variational optimization problem. So when one minimizes it, one can see that the minimum cannot be a trivial one, cannot be replica symmetric at low enough temperature. And the fact that the array is ultrametric, so one approach to explain where this is coming from, this particular choice is coming from, is according to the result above, a consequence of the gelanda guerre identities. Right? So if we can explain where the gelanda guerre identities are coming from, then actually ultrametricity is just automatic consequence of these identities. And so to conclude, let me um, just say a few words about where the gelanda guerre identities are coming from. And where this is coming from is actually this phenomenon that the energy concentrates on a constant level, or the Gibbs distribution concentrates on a constant level of energy. 
Okay, which means that if we consider this energy function on our space of assignments or configurations, and here we scale it by n to make uh, the maximum of order 1, then there will be this level, some constant level, such that the configuration with energy in a narrow band around this level will carry most of the weight. If we take the statement and then we test it or we integrate it against any test function on the assignments, then an integration by parts, right, because we chose the interaction parameters to be Gaussian, one can use uh, Gaussian integration by parts to see that this concentration of energy can be expressed by exactly this so-called Guerlain guerre identities. Now, of course, there are some technical details here that I'm not going into, but one thing that I wanted to emphasize is that um, these Guerlain guerre identities turn out to be very powerful in applications. You know, for the reason is that the proof of these identities is rather soft and has a lot of flexibility built in. And in particular, once this idea has been understood in the setting of the sharing Turkey-Patrick model, one can easily transfer it to many other models under mild uh, assumptions or mild conditions on those models in the perturbative sense, that one can sort of add a relatively small perturbation to the model which does not affect the maximum or does not affect the free energy, but this perturbation can be used to enforce the Guerlain de Guerre identities. And so, in many different models, one can get these identities and their consequences. So, for example, the ultrametricity of the overlaps just by adding a small perturbation to the model. And moreover, another very um, important feature of this is that this perturbation can be designed for more general overlaps. So instead of considering the overlap that I described above, one can actually map our configuration space into by some map into a Hilbert space. The only condition is that the self-overlap should be constant, or in other words, the, this map is into some sphere in this Hilbert space, and then the overlap can be defined as a scalar product in that Hilbert space. And so one can design these perturbations in such a way that these generalized overlaps also satisfy Guerlain de Guerre identities and satisfy ultrametricity, and so one can derive a lot of important consequences from this. So for example, we can also solve various variations of the SK model. So for example, the number of dorms doesn't have to be just two. One can consider the so-called POTS version of the SK model. Also, the interactions can be non-homogeneous in the sense that we can split the students into several groups, for example, into boys and girls, and then we can make the variance of the interaction dependent on which groups the pair of students a student belongs to. Right? So interactions between boys and boys or girls and girls or boys and girls can have can all have different variants. And so we can solve um, a large class of models of this type and actually some more general models with vector spins that I'm not going to describe here. And so to conclude here, I didn't have time to, you know, give um, credit to sort of all the people that were involved in the development of these ideas. And also, you know, there are many interesting directions in spin glasses and many interesting applications in various areas. So if somebody is interested to look into that, I would uh, refer to the accompanying 
article for the ICM proceedings.